Well, good afternoon, everyone. I, uh, I would like to welcome you to this event, the very first event in this semester's program in the Center for Catholic Studies at Fairfield University. We obviously don't know exactly where all of you are, but wherever you are, we're delighted you're here and we're looking forward to spending an hour or so with you debating a topic of considerable historical and contemporary interest. So the very first living theology workshop, I think you can call it, is dedicated to the topic Catholic, Jesuits, and slavery. And there will be uh, three of us talking with you on this topic for the next hour or so. While we wait for, make sure that everyone who is uh, participating is, is actually on the screen, I thought I would just use this moment to do a little commercial for our next event, uh, which is taking place on October the 7th. So that's uh, two weeks from today. Again, it's at a similar time, it's at five o'clock. And at five o'clock, two weeks from today, we have one of the major lectures that we offer every, every uh, year. This is the O'Callaghan Lecture on uh, Women in the Church. And at five o'clock on Wednesday, October the 7th, it will be offered by a Sister Colleen Gibson of uh, the Sisters of St. Joseph. Uh, now, some of you may know her, some of you may not. Uh, she's a Fairfield grad, uh, class of uh, 2009. She was valedictorian. She was captain of the Women's Rugby Club. And now she's coming back to speak on the topic, showing up the radical work of commitment in uncertain times. So you can uh, go on to the Fairfield University Catholic Studies website, fairfield.edu slash cs, and you can register for that. And while you're there, you can see the other uh, six or so events that we'll be offering between now and the end of the semester. So we really do uh, hope that you'll take a look and join us if you possibly can. And I think uh, today's going to be very interesting. And I know that Colleen Gibson uh, is, a, is a great thoughtful speaker, a great presence. So um, we uh, will look forward to having you then. Now, just a word about how we proceed here. I'm actually going to uh, start things off by giving you a little bit of historical background to this topic. And after I give you a little bit of historical background, we will turn to our two speakers for today. And the two speakers, in order in which they will speak, I'm just going to introduce them very, very um, briefly, because that's our procedure in living theology. Probably should have said my own name is uh, Paul Lakeland, and I direct the Center for Catholic Studies. And you are uh, uh, watching two major speakers from the university faculty who will really take on this topic in their own uh, way and in their own words uh, after I do this historical background. So first, after I speak, first will be uh, Professor Rochelle Rundevel, who is chair of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. And to follow her, uh, Professor Clarence Hardy, who is a colleague of mine in the Department of Religious Studies. So those are the people who you will be hearing from uh, shortly. Uh, one thing that um, you may need to know is that you have the opportunity, if you wish, to pose questions to people. You don't have to wait till the end of the session. You can, if the question occurs to you as we go along, you can uh, place that question on uh, the Q&A. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see a little icon that says Q&A, and if you go in there, you can type in your question, and then at the end of our speakers, we'll have some time, I'm sure, to look at at least some of the questions that you, uh, that you put forward. So that's pretty much what I need to say uh, before uh, we begin. So let me begin then this little historical component by, by telling you that really, when people think about slavery in the United States or think about American slavery, they naturally enough tend to think about slavery in the antebellum South. 
But I want us to begin by realizing that slavery in, uh, in the Americas, in the colonies, goes back to really to the very beginning of the colonizing of the continent. And it, it has been the product of really three different colonial powers, Spain, France, and England. So let's first get back behind the assumptions about uh, the English colonies. Very few people have ever heard of Estebanico. We only know his one name, but he's a very important starting point for our conversation because in 1532, this is how far back we're going, in 1532, four survivors of a huge expedition to the Americas, about 300 men, four survivors set off on a trek across the, what is now the southern part of the United States. Just four guys, they left from Florida, and they ended up, they went through what is now Texas, and they ended up in Mexico City. This is a huge trip. I assume they walked or had a horse, but that was the only, the only way they could have done it. And one of those four, his name was Estebanico. His, his leader was a man called Cabeza de Vaca, which people have some, sometimes have heard of him. But we know three things about Estebanico. We know that he was an African, possibly a Moor, but from Africa. We know that he was a slave, and we know that he was a Catholic. And eventually, actually, he went on to the West Coast and evangelized uh, some of the, the indigenous peoples in what is now California and came to a, a rather sad and brutal end. But I wanted to mention his name at the beginning just to say at the very beginning of colonization, we have a black Catholic slave at work. So I just said these early colonizers divided into three groups, the Spanish, the French, and the British. The Spanish were busy mostly in Florida and in the Southwest. The French mostly in Canada and present day Louisiana. And the British along the Eastern seaboard. Each group engaged in slaveholding. And irony of ironies, since all were Christian, either Protestant or Catholic, they worked to convert or more precisely to baptize their slaves into their own tradition. European settlement of what would become the United States began on September the 8th, 1565, when Spanish Admiral Pedro Menendez de Aviles founded St. Augustine on the northeast Florida coast. The town of St. Augustine, really the first uh, settlement. He arrived with ships filled with soldiers, wives, children, and Africans who were mostly slaves. Now this is half a century before the British arrived in Jamestown with their own slaves in tow. And St. Augustine went on in time to become a haven for blacks who fled slavery in the English colonies, where they were welcomed by the Spanish as free blacks on one condition, that they accepted baptism into the Catholic religion. So they became Catholics and in that case, freedom from slavery. During this 18th century, the Florida territory was in Spanish hands for much of the time, the British or the English at other times, and it was finally ceded to the United States permanently in 1821. So this is Florida. By 1840, five years before it became a state, about 50,000 people lived in the territory half of them black slaves, and many, for them by no means all, baptized Catholics. Here's a strange question. What was the best time or the least bad time to be a slave in the Americas? My vote would be for the French colony of Louisiana in the first decades of the 18th century. At that time, the relations between slaves and their owners was governed by a legal document called the Code Noir, the Black Code. 
while we don't know how well the owners adhered to the code or the colony's government administered it, it did provide a number of important protections for slaves. For example, they were not allowed to work on Sundays, and if they were found working on Sundays, their owners lost their slaves. Of course, Sunday's the day of rest, and French Louisiana was Catholic. They were allowed to appeal to the attorney general if they were being abused or fed poorly. And their owners were forbidden to separate parents by selling one or the other, or to sell any child under the age of 14. The code is long and has many other provisions. It's a remarkable document, even if it did not relieve the brutality of that slavery in many areas under French control. Here is a page from the Code Noir, which shows some of the brutality I told you about the legal protections. There is the fleur-de-lis, the French symbol, and here is, the, is Article 38. The fugitive slave who has been on the run for one month from the day his master reported him to the police shall have his ears cut off and shall be branded with a fleur-de-lis on one shoulder. If he commits the same infraction for another month, again, counting from the day he is reported, he shall have his hamstring cut and be branded with a fleur-de-lis on the other so shoulder. The third time, he shall be put to death. So that's the other side of the Code Noir, but it did have some legal protections for people, and it did actually result in a higher percentage of blacks being free people of color than under the British system. So at that time, about 13% of blacks in Louisiana were free. In Mississippi, the percentage was 0.8%. So you can see there was some flexibility there. Actually, those freed were under restrictions from the Code Noir, but on average, they were exceptionally literate, with a significant number of them owning businesses, properties, and even slaves. Now, all of this notwithstanding, when we think about slavery in North America, we think mostly about the slaves held by British plantation owners in the last decades of the 18th century and the first half of the 19th. We should not forget, however, that the Maryland Catholics of a century before did not encounter a slave culture in the Americas so much as help found it. And here's a remarkable fact, something to puzzle over, I believe. In the 18th century, the Chesapeake Bay region was home to the second largest concentration of slave labor in the burgeoning British Empire. In 1790, when the first formal census of Maryland's population was taken by the United States government, roughly a third of the state's entire population was enslaved. Between 1743 and 1759, so a bit earlier, the average number of slaves owned by an elite planter in Maryland was 22. The average number of slaves owned by a Catholic plantation owner in Maryland, elite or clerical, was 31. 23, 31. Indeed, Catholics such as Charles Carroll of, An of Annapolis, the only Catholic to sign the Declaration of Independence, were some of the largest slaveholders in the entire colony. And notice that among the slaveholders were clerics, including Jesuits. In the late 18th century, the priests, formerly known as Jesuits, this is a complicated historical thing. There was like a 50 year period when Jesuits were abolished, but the people who had been Jesuits maintained a kind of community together. So at the end of the 18th century, they were in this limbo for a while, but they owned about 15,000 acres of land on the Eastern shore. So here's an example of this. Let me show you one example of this in this, in this uh, table here. See that table? 
So here is the Eastern shore. This is about 1760, something like that. And down the left-hand side, you can see the names of the plantations. And the second column shows you how many Jesuits lived at these plantations, how many acres they were, how many slaves they had, and then the last column is the annual income in uh, British pounds, pounds sterling. So look at the last line and you can see 12 Jesuits farmed or owned 12,000 acres of land uh, with the aid of 192 slaves. This is not inconsiderable. These same priests in the early 19th century, actually in 1832, sold 272 slaves to pay the debts that threatened the existence of Georgetown College. It's to the, and that was actually quite controversial, even among Catholics at the time, that they, that they would do this. It's to the credit, by the way, of two thirds of Georgetown students who voted in April last year to establish a semester fee to fund reparations for the descendants of these people. So why did Catholics hang on to slavery well into the 19th century? Some say it had a lot to do with the wish to be as American as possible, and in the Southern states at least, that meant slavery. It was also complicated by the fact that to a Southern Catholic, an abolitionist was a Northern freethinker, and many of them were. Others explained the complacency by citing the authority of St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas, both of whom thought slavery could be justified. And of course, lurking in the background were the words of St. Paul. Slaves, obey your masters. Masters, treat your slaves well. But the probable likeliest reasons were, one, that the economy of the South depended on slavery in this antebellum period, and two, Catholic leaders did not want to be seen to be challenging what was simply a fact of life in the South. It was hard enough for Catholics to gain acceptance as Americans as it was. Why rock the boat? So let me finish by just turning to a couple of bishops who spoke out in defense of slavery. The first, John England, was named Bishop of Charleston, South Carolina, exactly 200 years ago this month. And he was actually a pioneering liberal bishop. He created a bicameral legislature for the administration of this diocese in which lay people, men of course, had serious responsibilities. But when Pope Gregory XVI wrote a letter against slavery some two decades later, and a member of the South Carolina State Legislature accused the Pope of being an abolitionist, John England came to his defense. No, of course the Pope wasn't an abolitionist. He was simply opposed to the slave trade. Really? What's the difference? Well, it is quite wrong to take free people and enslave them, but for those who have lived in slavery for perhaps many generations, he thought, the situation is quite different. And the second bishop, John Kenrick of Philadelphia, wrote in much the same vein and let his words be the last word here. Though, and I quote, slavery does not wipe out the equality of nature among human beings, and he believes slaves should be well treated, he goes on, slavery thus understood is not at odds with natural law in such a way that it might be considered a sin. For the greater good of the human race, slavery is endured with Christian kindness up to the present day among civilized nations. End of quote. I leave you to determine how much Christian kindness the slaves encountered. And with that,
you have a little historical background and that's the end of my contribution to this for now at least i'll come back to you when we get to question and answer but for now uh, i want to turn this over to uh, rochelle Grunbevel, who will pick up the argument here so rochelle over to you thank you very much professor lakeland so I'll order my comments in this way. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my background um, as it relates to Catholicism. I'll talk a little bit about Catholic slave owning and then pick up on the question where Dr. Lakeland left us a few minutes ago with regard to why would Catholics own slaves or support slavery? And then end with some reflection on how this is related to some more contemporary issues with the Catholic Church and racial justice. So first to talk about my own background. So I um, went to Catholic elementary school and Catholic high school. I grew up in Queens, New York. And um, when I was in Catholic school, a lot of my friends would be surprised to find out that I was actually Catholic. A lot of my friends that were going to public schools or the neighborhoods with me because they had this perception that Catholics were white. And based on a New York Times article that was written in August, about 3% of American Catholics are Black. So that perception was probably somewhat correct at the time. Um, but they had all kinds of misconceptions about what uh, Catholic Church was like. Um, surprised that in my church was almost entirely Black. Surprised that we had gospel music. Surprised that we had liturgical dance. I'm surprised that we had youth groups and youth retreats, primarily with uh, Blacks, um, youth, young people who would go to these things. So there was this, this real curiosity about what it meant to be um, a Black Catholic. But I will say, um, despite the fact that I went to Catholic school from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade, we really, or I don't recall us ever really talking about Catholic slave owning. Um, or talking about Catholics really playing any role um, during the time of slavery or during the time of, of abolition. It wasn't discussed explicitly um, in school or in church. Um, with regard to my schooling experience, I probably had maybe three to four Black teachers in elementary school and, and maybe probably about the same number um, in high school. But when issues of race came up, we again, we really didn't talk about slavery or that period. So I think it's, it, that's curious to me um, why that's the case. Um, so to kind of move on from that, to think about why is it that Catholics would participate in slavery? Um, why would they not speak out against it, right? Um, of course, there's a financial incentive which Professor Lakeland just showed us in those tables, right, with regard to the economic engine that was owning enslaved people. But if we think about Christians, one of the central tenets of our faith is to love your neighbor as yourself. And clearly owning a, a person runs counter to that, right? But um, Professor Lakeland also talked about how Catholics were trying to become accepted or trying to be viewed as legitimate Americans. But if we think again about American ideals, if we think about the Declaration of Independence and we think about the words that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator from certain inalienable rights that are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the ideals of life and liberty and equality that were expressed in the Declaration of Independence also runs counter to enslavement. And it definitely runs counter to the kind of enslavement that we had in the United States, where, which was chattel slavery, where the people who were born of slaves were slaves for the rest of their lives. So as Catholics are trying to be perceived as American and authentic, owning enslaved persons is running counter to both of the ideals around what it means to be American and what it means to be Catholic. Yet for some reason, Catholics still continue to own slaves. 
And I think that this is related to larger issues that are taking place even now with regard to the Catholic Church and issues of racial justice. Um, there was an article in the New York Times as well, published um, in August, that was titled, Racism Makes a Liar of God, and by Elizabeth Brunick. And in it, she was talking about uh, Gloria Purvis, who was a co-host of a popular Catholic radio show co called Morning Glory. And Gloria Purvis uh, denounced the killing of George Floyd at the end of May and talked, of, and talked about other killings of unarmed Black men and women and talked about these as being issues of racism. And she received some backlash on social media, um, on Twitter, via email, and then her show ended up being canceled in June. And that article in the New York Times talks about this um, belief by some that there's a tension between the Catholic Church, Black Lives Matter, and racial justice movements. So some of these long-term issues related to uh, Catholic uh, slaveholding or the perception that being Catholic and Black are kind of antithetical are showing up again now when we're talking about the Black Lives Matter movement. Also, with regard to um, racial justice and, and right now, Brian Massengill has uh, given an interview recently with Commonweal Magazine where he was talking about the Catholic Church being uncomfortable with talking about racial justice outwardly for fear of making some white Catholics uncomfortable. And because of this fear of being uncomfortable, the Catholic Church has not been as proactive as some other groups to be outwardly anti-racist. And that as long as we're concerned with those issues, we won't really be able to confront racism in the Catholic Church or to be able to be a movement for justice outside the Catholic Church. So even though um, Catholic slaveholding was some time ago, and even though we're now at a point where we do see some clergy of color, there are very few that I've known um, Black American clergy um, in the Catholic Church. And I think this also speaks to sort of an unwillingness to speak about issues of racism. And this perhaps is a significant issue and that will be a lot harder to mobilize um, younger Catholics, especially younger Black Catholics, to be involved in the Catholic Church. So I think I'll end my remarks there for now, but look forward to questions in the Q&A. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, I thought it would be useful for me to at least uh, give you some context for my own um, intellectual work uh, and how I come to the topic that uh, Paul has introduced. Uh, my own work concerns um, largely the uh, um, development of Black religious traditions in the 20th century, which is largely understood um, as deeply connected and associated with Protestantism. Um, in my own work, um, where I've been thinking quite a bit about the legacy of slavery, the habit uh, among many of us who work in this area has been to connect quite deeply um, the formations of Protestantism in particular in North America uh, with race. Um, let me give you an example of what I mean. One of the more important books to emerge in the last 10 years uh, was written um, by a woman by the name of Rebecca Getz. And the subtitle of her book is How Christianity Created Race. And in her book, she basically just, she describes how Protestant slaveholders in an attempt to um, maintain their ability to um, um, retain um, mastery and dominance, um, racialized um, 
what would become black people to exclude them from the possibilities of becoming Christian in the first place. So in my own work, I hadn't done much um, thinking or uh, pursued with any serious depth um, the connection between Catholicism in the United States and the development of slavery and um, the legacy of white supremacy in the centuries that uh, follow. Um, but I do think that Paul is very helpful in making, lifting up the, the, uh, for attention, uh, Georgetown University's recent declaration uh, and recent attempt to grapple with, uh, uh, with their connection with slavery. And I wanted to deepen a couple of comments that Paul had made in his own uh, brief um, connection, a uh, brief uh, summary of uh, Georgetown's situation um, uh, is, is quite right that uh, what set off the debate and recent conversation at Georgetown uh, Jesuit uh, founded school um, is the selling of 272 enslaved persons um, to planters in Louisiana um, to save the institution. Um, I will say at the very beginning here, it's important to recognize this is not the last time that Georgetown has this connection with slavery. There were enslaved persons all the way up to um, the emancipation of slaves in DC in the 1860s. Um, and indeed, much of the resource base of Georgetown University in the previous century, since it was based in Maryland, a lot of the major benefactors of Georgetown had links, direct links uh, to the plantations in Maryland. And there was a really robust um, slave trade and slave industry in Maryland. And Georgetown had had this uh, long association with benefactors uh, who were enmeshed in slavery. Um, uh, many of you might know um, Francis Scott Key, the writer of the um, the, the, the American anthem. Um, his cousin was a major benefactor uh, to, to Georgetown. And these were all Maryland, uh, Maryland um, elites. Um, uh, so it, um, as Paul has suggested, in some measure, it's really hard to differentiate how Catholics acted in the 19th century as it related to slavery and how Protestants acted as it related to slavery. Um, and so I do think it's useful to um, deepen, drill down on something that Paul had um, alluded to in his own um, wrestling with how to think about um, uh, Catholics and their participation in Jesuits in particular and their participation with slavery um, in the 19th century. The question that he framed was, what does it mean to be an American? Is this an attempt to be just as American as everyone else? And of course, the way this is usually framed, and Rochelle hinted at this in terms of thinking about this, the way this is usually framed is as this big major contradiction uh, between uh, American values and perhaps Christian values and the reality uh, and the reality of slavery. Uh, when we think about the American experiment, the way we usually tell the story is that it's really fixated on this notion of being the first major democratic um, expression in the new world, so-called new world, that begins with a declaration of independence, celebrating universal values, and then instantiates itself in the constitution with the declaration, we the people. But I thought it would be useful um, to trouble this notion of what it means to be an American and whether there really is 
a deep contradiction between that Americanness and the claims and legacy and reality of slavery. I was reminded of this because in my own courses, one of the major figures that I've been teaching in, 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 as a source of conversation with students is the great thinker W.E.B. Du Bois, um, whose most famous text, Souls of Black Folk, um, one way of thinking about that text is that it's his attempt to tell the American story by putting black people at the center. And what does that mean when one tells a story that way? And when I was uh, sharing this with students, we would highlight his seventh chapter in that book, which is um, where he explores what he calls the Black Belt. This is a, a re part of the region in Georgia which actually originally was named after the richness of the soil, but then closely became associated with the numbers of black people who were there. And so he tells his story about, um, uh, about the origins of the black belt. And he tells a story from the origin, from the perspective of black people. And he begins the story, not with this grand declaration about democracy, he begins the story with the displacement of Cherokee and Creek people in Georgia, pushed out and displaced and pushed west. And then how African people were brought to replace these native peoples to work the land. And then he goes on to describe um, the society that is um, established in this black belt and he doesn't describe uh, a democracy, he describes an aristocracy where you have landed gentry who serve at the pleasure of the king, this king being cotton and the profit motive of producing cotton. And then he makes the, the jump by looking at the 1880s and 1890s, and this is when he's Im most immediately writing, and he basically argues that the dem democratic um, experiment only lasted for about a dozen years right after the Civil War and what you actually had happen was a reconstitution of the original aristocracy that was um, um, there um, with the uh, with the British settlers in Georgia. I say all this go back to one of the founding figures of the American experiment, James Madison often described as the father of the Constitution. And in a private letter that he wrote in his 1780s, 1790s, somewhere in that area, he wrote in his private letter, where slavery prevails, the society is democratic in name, but arist uh, um, aristocratic in fact. And so this to circle right, right back around to where Paul brought us in the very beginning when he asked the question, what does it mean to be an American? And if Catholics were trying to be just as American as everyone else in the middle of the 19th century, and this is the time that Georgetown is debating about what do they need to do to survive, so we need to sell these slaves in order to be able to survive. If as um, the scholar Annette Gordon Reed has put it, if we told the story about the founding of America as the um, aristocracy of white men overlaid with the language of democracy, then maybe this is not so much a paradox, right? When we have this conversation about what does it mean, right? To be an American and be connected with slavery. What does it mean to be a Christian and related to slavery is all about getting along and not rocking the boat and not disturbing the system that is already deeply entrenched and established. So I'll leave, I'll leave um, that as just an initial attempt to reframe the question a little bit um, in terms of thinking about this question of both American identity and religious identity. And I'll stop there.
Well, uh, thank you, uh, Rochelle and uh, Clarence, for getting us started here. And we've got some time now to think about, to, to hear from some of you uh, in the, in the uh, some, some of you out there, wherever you are, who might have a comment or a question uh, about anything you've heard here. And uh, there's two or three questions sort of lined up, but I would encourage anyone who wishes to do so to put something in now, just go to the Q&A at the bottom of the page and just type in uh, your question and we'll, we'll get to it uh, if we possibly can. So I, I, the first question we, we have here is um, in, in some ways asking, uh, I think it's, it's a question for anyone, certainly for Rochelle or, or Clarence, and um, it's asking you to speculate a little bit, but the question would be is this. So, so the, 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 the writer of the question, uh, first of all, likes what she's hearing and says, I'm glad we're talking about this. And I was wondering if we think Fairfield University Jesuits might have owned slaves if we were established in the 18th or even the 19th century. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody has a thought about that. I mean, in some ways, the question is in, impossible to answer, but that that example of Georgetown, I think, is a crucial one, right? I mean, uh, I think many people imagine that Georgetown was this oasis of liberty and good, correct, religious, devout thinking. And it's, it's a bit of a shock to find out um, just how enmeshed um, Georgetown was. Um, in, uh, in slavery. And even with the declaration that they were going to try to avoid um, the slave trade, they participate in it, right? In order to save their own skin, right? That moment in 1838, when they sell, um, they were wrestling with this idea for about 20 years about what to do with these enslaved persons. Um, and they finally decided shortly after a major crash in 1837, and it started to pick up a bit in 1838, um, they decided to, to sell their enslaved persons to a planter in Louisiana with the guarantee, with two provisions, that, they were, that enslaved persons would be in a situation where they could continue to practice the Catholic faith. And with the understanding that they would not separate husbands and wives, as was often the case in the 1830s and 1840s. This is not some bold stand against, um, um, against slavery. This is um, when it really gets tight, um, you're just as enmeshed as other people. Um, and the distinctions are hard to determine when framed against other people in that same uh, geographic region. So um, at least that's how I would begin to address the question. I think one of the things that, um, <clears throat> that we, uh, we certainly know, which I don't know whether this would lead us to answer the question yes or not, is that in, in uh, in 18th and early 19th century Fairfield, Connecticut, there were slaves. Not many, but there were a few. So that might lead us towards saying yes, especially since if the Jesuits had been here, then they'd have had 200 acres to take care of, right? Um, Rochelle, do you wanna say anything about that or? Should we yeah, I, I mean, I think part of the question, um, under the question might be about, because we're in the North as well, right? We're in New England. I think it tends to be the perception that those in the North were not really profiting from slavery. And that's definitely not the case. Um, many of the insurance companies based in, you know, in Hartford, Connecticut, were writing insurance policies on enslaved persons, right? And those were profitable for their owners as well. So I think under the question is also, you know, how has the North profited from slavery, even though there were not as many enslaved persons up, up north, but they def so definitely did have financial benefits from it as well. There is uh, another question here, just moving moving us along a little bit here. So 
So here's a question uh, about Lincoln. So, so the question is, says, it's interesting that Abe Lincoln wanted to send slaves back to their countries of origin after emancipation. And the question is wondering if, if he just believed they were inferior or he realized they'd be released into a racist society and system and would have real struggles. So what was Lincoln thinking about, uh, I suppose you would call it repatriating people? You're nodding your head, Rochelle. Sounds like you might like to take that one. <laughs> I was nodding my head because I remember Nicole Hannah Jones wrote about that in her 1619 Project essay, right? She talked about these um, black statesmen who were invited to come to the White House to talk to Lincoln. And they thought it was going to be about sort of ways to make things right or to better integrate, you know, um, newly freed people into American society. And they were so shocked by his suggestion that they should really go back to a place they've never been, right? Somewhere in, in West Africa. So, I mean, I definitely don't, I, my opinion is not that he thought that it was gonna be so difficult for those people who were newly freed to integrate and that he was sort of concerned about their well being, more so than he just saw them as so incompatible with what America was at that time that they must go back. Um, that they were so inferior and so different that they wouldn't be able to do well here or were, or were a threat to whites. So therefore, let's just send them back to from where they came. At least that's how I read it. I mean, I think that's, I think that's quite right, Rochelle. I mean, I just, it's, it's hard. Um, I don't think m m the majority of white politicians in the 19th century believe that it was even possible to have a multiracial democracy. And if you actually think about it in the United States, we've only had a multiracial democracy in the United States since 1965. And one might argue that one of the major debates in terms of what it means to be in America right now in 2020 is still wrestling with that basic question about whether it's even possible to be a multiracial society in this particular um, legacy of British colonialism in North America. I think it's, um, I don't wanna get too um, political necessarily here, but I think it's still, uh, it's still up for debate. I think, you know, I think maybe people have a better answer to that question in a, a couple months if, <laughs> if there's a free and fair election. Um, is it would be one way to say it. The other thing I would say is that Lincoln does evolve, but he evolves largely because he's forced to. He's forced to um, because the war is going badly in the early part of the 1860s. And uh, the Emancipation Proclamation that he issues helps to reframe a war that was originally about just union to a moral cause against slavery. Um, and so he's forced to by circumstance, and he's also forced to because black people themselves are entering in the fray in a very direct way, whether that's becoming a part of the army um, that was doing battle um, against the southern states, or whether that's about being on, on plantations and deciding not to work very hard or going on a kind of general strike as W.B. Du Bois would put it in, term, in his book on Reconstruction. Um, and so circumstance and black people themselves help to force Lincoln's evolution to actually begin to think about the possibilities of a multiracial um, um, reality. Um, but I think, um, it's hard to find a, a white politician in the 19th century who really believed in the possibilities of multiracial democracy. It's just hard to find it. And uh, when, uh, when Lincoln did that, he lost the Catholic vote. He did. I mean, the, the 1864 election, he lost the Catholic vote because he switched the meaning to emancipation. So the, the Catholics were very supportive until it turned out to be about emancipation, which is a sad thing. Um, 
Rochelle, I have a question for you here. Uh, and it goes back to your early, your first remarks about um, your background in Queens. And the question is really this, that you, you know, you talked about this church with its, with its, uh, you know, its gospel singing and so on, and its retreats with black uh, students and, and et cetera. And the question really is, um, isn't it, it, I think the questioner is a bit surprised that it sounds more like Protestant traditions where there's white churches and black churches. And the story about Catholic churches, rightly or wrongly, is they tend to be more integrated. So was that not the case? I guess that's the question. That was definitely not the case um, in my experience. Um, so the church that I went to, and my, and my mom still goes to that church, um, was blocks from the house where I grew up. And it was I'm going to say 95% black. Um, now it was multi-ethnic in a sense that there were people who were um, African American, people who were from Trinidad and Jamaica, different parts of the Caribbean, but it was in no way um, multiracial. Actually, my first real experiences with the multiracial Catholic church is the church in my neighborhood now. So I live in Nassau County now, and the church close to me is St. Boniface. And it's a very multiracial, multi-ethnic, multilingual church. There are services in multiple languages every Sunday. Um, and if any like high holiday, there are multiple languages in the liturgy. So, but that was really my first kind of experience with that. The experiences I had growing up was not like that. Um, even though our pastors were always um, white and we had maybe a handful of white parishioners, it was overwhelmingly black at the time and it still is. Now, actually the newest groups are um, Nigerian Americans who have services in, in um, different their languages too. Thank you. Um, I guess that answers the question. Uh, so here's another, another question here. This is an obvious one, I think, that was going to come up. So the question is short, and I don't know. I think both of you might have a response here. What do Jesuits owe Black Americans due to their participation in slavery? Should, what kind of reparations are, uh, are owed in justice, I guess? That's the question. I was looking um, at Georgetown's site um, preparing for this, and they definitely have some links about how descendants of those who were enslaved there have to gather their genealogical records and can make themselves known to Georgetown admissions. It's not quite clear from the site, but I assume that that means that they might be treated the way um, alumni's children might be treated, perhaps. I know that the fee that um, Paul referenced with regard to the students voting to have a fee go towards the descendants, it seems to be related to some kind of community-based projects that the descendants would work on with Georgetown officials, that there'd be some kind of mutual agreement about the kinds of projects that they could work on. So that could be a way to go. Um, it could be in the form of uh, scholarships, reduced tuition, or efforts in community that are affected by those who had, um, for those who are descendants might be a way to approach it. I don't know if you have other ideas, Clarence. Um, bring, every, bring it all on. I, I'm open to almost any conversation about reparations. I do think the Georgetown example is a useful one. Um, because I think the challenge is to think about it, not just in financial terms, but absolute moral terms. And I actually am taking this a little bit from one of the leaders of the work study there, a guy by the name of, um, his name is Adam, Adam Rothman. He's one of the historians who was leading um, the project there. And the point that he makes is that if you actually break down the 272 enslaved persons who were sold, <laughs> Um, to Louisiana. It's not some place you want to be sold, by the way. You don't want to be sold down to sugar plantations where they work you even worse conditions than in, in Maryland at the time. Um, it breaks down to about a million today dollars, 
but that doesn't actually include all the enslaved persons that were working there before and all those enslaved persons who were working there all the way up through the 1860s. Um, it doesn't include um, the benefactors um, who gave money to the institution, partly based on their connections to slavery. And so what Rothman actually argues, um, and I think this is an important point, is that when they, when they sold enslaved persons in 1838, the existence of the school was at stake. It wasn't just simply about money. So in a very real way, Georgetown would not exist without enslaved persons. So I actually sort of think, I'm, I'm open to almost any kind of financial reckoning. Right? And I think if we're just committed to thinking about that, and there are a number of schools, universities, and other organizations are engaged in this kind of practice. And, you know, Princeton Theological Seminary has done a similar kind of historical audit. Columbia University has done a similar kind of um, historical audit. audit. A lot of these institutions are doing um, this, this very important work. But the idea that our society would not exist without this theft from people. I think actually puts the, the terms in a very stark moral way <laughs> so that, um, um, which should motivate us to think really deeply uh, and bring all of our moral imagination to the task of how to uh, wrestle with um, this afterlife of slavery as some scholars have described it. Thank you. There's a there's a little follow up which I can probably answer, <clears throat> but the little follow up uh, asks um, whether any other Jesuit schools at this time were in the same kind of trouble, and who gave them permission to do this? Did they have to get permission from head office or whatever? And actually, that's interesting. First, there weren't any other Jesuit schools at this time, right? So this is the first and original in the United States. But the, the president of Georgetown at the time was a man called Thomas Malady. And when he did this, Rome was furious with him. Because in a strange way that Catholics don't really understand this, but actually Rome was more liberal than the United States in terms of Catholicism at that time. They were entirely opposed to slavery. And when he sold them, these slaves, they were furious and they hauled him off to Rome, but only for a year. And then he was sent back to become the first president of Holy Cross. So I don't know how you, how you read that one. That's a little tricky to figure that one out. Okay. So we had another, another question here. So here's a question. I'm just going to read the question for you. Given the interconnection of American Catholicism and racism, what steps should or could contemporary American Catholics take to assist in dismantling the structural systems of oppression and racism that exist today? And should that be seen as an expression of their faith? So it's a question, what should Catholics be doing and should they be doing it because they're Catholics? I think that's the question. Anyone want to tackle that? I'll take a try. Um, if you uh, read Brian Massengale, um, who writes a lot about the Catholic Church and racial justice um, in his interviews, he would argue, yes, um, American Catholics should be taking an active stand against racism. They should be anti-racist. And in one of his interviews with Commonwealth Magazine, he talks about um, racism as their liturgy. Um, and he talks about how there is essentially, I'm paraphrasing, like the person or, or institution that commits this racist act, but then there are people who enable it um, by helping in some way. And then, then there are the people even beyond that, the bystanders who are witnessing it and not saying anything. Um, so Massengale would say that small ways American Catholics can fight racism is that when they see things happening with their families and their friends that are um, discriminatory, whether it's like a racist joke or a behavior 
or an action that they should call their family members out and their friends out and say that what you're doing is inappropriate, it's racist, I don't agree with it, instead of looking the other way. Um, so that, that's, that's a small way. In a larger way, I think um, folks like Massingale would say that um, Catholics should be involved in fights for racial justice, whether that's you know, with regard to how you vote or what kind of causes you donate to or actually how you might protest, but to be active in a, in a public way as well. Um, I think that Massingale would say, and I, I would agree with those things. Okay, well, um, we're a little over 5.30 and we have a few more minutes and we have two more questions that I can see. So I think we have time to take, to take those. So um, the first actually, it's an interesting question I've never thought about. Maybe our two speakers have. So here's the question. What led to slavery becoming color-based rather than from conquest? I don't know. Are there examples of colonialism that has enslaved on a different basis or, or what? Any, any thought about that? I'm having trouble with that question myself. Clarence. That's a very uh, complicated question, I would say. And there's a lot of debate uh, uh, about the origins of um, racial, racializing identities um, in the New World and, else, and elsewhere. Uh, the book that I had made um, reference to is in some ways, uh, and most of my work is so North American focused that, um, you know, a lot of the major actors were Protestants who were in some ways effectively trying to create a, an identity that was perennially pagan, permanently pagan. And it's that overlay that we see blackness emerge in North America. Um, and so there is this, there is this kind of connection <laughs> um, between um, the language and vocabulary and habits of Christianity and how Christianity treats the pagan and the heathen and how race begins to emerge in a similar kind of cultural matrix and habit. But there's been a lot of discussion um, about in this, in a lot of the scholarly discussion, Catholics come off a little bit better than Protestants do. Um, and, um, but, um, you know, I don't know entirely how to answer the question. I could, ha I could point you to a number of books that have been wrestling with this question of Protestant supremacy versus Christian supremacy and how we should work through um, the connections between those two things and, and the emergence of race uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries. But um, I mean, that's my initial, most of my work is much more 20th century based. And so I just consume this as a, you know, interested reader that, as opposed to someone who is um, deeply um, uh, in the sources and working through, um, but I can name four genome of races, rate of the races by Colin Kidd. There are a number of uh, books that are about this, this development and connection between race and religion as the primary modes for thinking about human difference. Well, we have one final question and uh, it's a big one. So uh, here's the question. Do you think Fairfield University as a Jesuit institution represents the Jesuit values we emphasize daily, women and men for others, forming and educating agents of change, and so on? If not, what can the university do to do so? This is including, I'm just reading what it says here, this is including the Black Stags Matter page on Instagram and the alumni support group. Rochelle. So um, I think like any institution, you know, our mission is our, our ideal. And I think that every day we have to work hard at living up to our mission. Um, the uh, Black Stags Matter and the Fairfield Alumni Response Team has been vocal about some of the ways that they think that Fairfield University can change for the better. 
um, to become a even more anti-racist institution. And since um, those groups have you know, talked about things, things that they would like to see change at Fairfield, uh, Fair, different Fairfield uh, administrators and groups have met representatives from those groups to talk about what that might look like. Um, RJSJ at Fairfield continues to meet and strategize about, you know, ways to improve our campus climate and culture. Um, there are more you know, faculty of color, for example, being hired at Fairfield. So there are definitely um, signs of progress and there are ways that I think we continue to grow and hopefully conversations with these alumni groups and with current students and staff and faculty can make that more of a reality. Okay. Um, that's actually a, a, a good segue uh, into our conclusions here. So before I thank people, let me go back to, a, I don't know how many of you are listening and now we're here right at the beginning when I did a commercial for our next event, which is taking place uh, at 5 p.m. on Wednesday, October the 7th, so it's two weeks, uh, called Showing Up, the Radical Work of Commitment in Uncertain Times by a uh, Fairfield alum religious sister uh, who works in inner city Camden, New Jersey. So she, she sees a lot of uh, social uh, issues. So she's gonna speak then, but the reason this was a segue is because I wanted to come back to um, the Living Theology event. So we have three every semester. This is the first. The second one will actually be on a Saturday morning, uh, October the 17th, and that will be devoted to uh, talking with women from the first undergraduate class at Fairfield in 1970. What was it like? Which could be quite interesting, I think. But the third of the events uh, on November the 11th, again, it's a Wednesday at 4.30 like this one, we're going to devote to the whole issue of Black Lives Matter at Fairfield. And we are hoping very much that that will be led by students more than by uh, faculty or any, anyone else. So that's uh, something else to look at. Uh, if you go to fairfield.edu slash CS, you can find all the events for the semester and you can register for any of them right there. And they're all no charge. So with that, my thanks to, of course, first to Rochelle and to Clarence for, uh, for doing this work. Uh, my thanks to uh, Mary Crimmins, who is the uh, person in the Center for Catholic Studies who does all the nitty gritty work that I don't do. And uh, thanks to the staff at the Media Center for putting all this, uh, making all this happen. And while we're doing this, Anthony is running around in the background, making sure that it's clear for you. So. Thanks to all of them. And of course, above all, thanks to those of you who uh, attended this. I hope you found it worthwhile. Uh, I hope you'll keep talking about what you heard. And I hope you will come back soon. So with that, this, this concludes our session. So thank you all so much. And we'll see you along the way somewhere. Thank you. Mm -hmm.